Hi, uh, good evening, guys, and uh, I and Dr. Ashad welcome you to yet another session of our PG clinics. Thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, we are very grateful to uh, Ashok Sham and Dr. Neeraj Bijlani uh, and the entire team of Ortho TV for helping us through this. It's a it's a continuation of our uh, Indian Orthopedic Association PG course, which had received rave reviews, uh, and we and and we are getting plenty of viewership from students of our past lectures. So introducing the two speakers today, Dr. Dipit Sau is a eminent shoulder surgeon and uh, he's uh, in heavily into research, publication, clinical work. He'll be speaking on clinical evaluation of the shoulder joint. Dr. Hetal Chiniwala is a very senior shoulder surgeon, very old friend of ours, mine and Dr. Arshad. He's been in this field for years and years. He'll be speaking on uh, stiff shoulder and cuff tears. Uh, the whole objective, as Dr. Argekar has repeatedly said, is that we expect that you have a certain level of knowledge in these subjects. And this is like a, a finishing school kind of exercise. So it sort of helps you sharpen your clinical evaluation skills and make a better case presentation. And if they don't come as short case, then you write a very good short note or prepare you for the long answers. So best of luck, guys, all the students, please pay attention. And uh, the first speaker for today evening is Dr. Dipit Sahu. Over to you, Dipit. Yes. I'll just share my screen now. And and okay. So is my screen okay? Hello? Yes. Yes, perfect. Yes, Go yes, good. Okay. So uh, I think we are starting the shoulder session today um, for the PG students and uh, this endeavor that uh, Dr. Tushar and Dr. Argekar has started uh, is, is an excellent one. I'd really like to thank them. Uh, it also uh, enables us to uh, have some feedback and gain some knowledge whenever we are presenting here, uh, as well as the ortho TV group uh, with Dr. Ashok Shyam and Dr. Neeraj. Uh, uh, they are doing a great job. So my thanks to them as well. Uh, Hetal is a great colleague and we keep discussing many shoulder topics. So we'll be doing that today also, how to go ahead with the shoulder examination and important points in uh, shoulder pathologies. I will be speaking on shoulder examination, the key points which you should be knowing when you have a shoulder patient. So now, most of the times you will be concerned with a cuff tear or an instability patient and you may have a patient where you may need to decide if it is a cuff tear patient or instability and for most practical purposes, those two are different subgroups. So there is a very small overlap in the real world. A cuff tear and an inst unstable patient may have both the pathologies together, but the, those are very small percentage, 5 to 10% maybe. Uh, we may see it, we do see it, but for all practical purposes and for all the postgraduate students, I think you may either have a cuff tear patient or a cuff pathology patient, or you may have an unstable shoulder patient. So those two will be separate subjects and you should not confuse both of them. Your diagnosis should either be leading you towards a cuff tear or to an unstable shoulder, but it cannot be a mixed pathology for uh, at the postgraduate level. There are a couple of distinctly uh, distinguishing features of both pathologies, which you should be aware of. For example, the history and physical examination in a cuff tear is very important. So is the X-ray and MRI, but in an unstable patient, the most important part is the history. Then is your physical examination. Your diagnosis is made on history, mostly coupled with a physical exam for an unstable patient. X-ray MRI are only adjunct uh, and they give you some more information, but for diagnosis, it is a clinical diagnosis of an unstable shoulder. When you have a cuff tear patient, you also are suspecting a cuff tear on clinical examination history, but you need X-ray and MRI to confirm it. This is the difference between the two pathologies. The other distinguishing feature is that the cuff tears are mostly seen above 40 years of age. So uh, the age distribution 
mostly gives you an idea that you are going one way or the other. So if you have a young patient, mostly in 20s, you are more likely to have or, or, or very likely to have an unstable shoulder. If you have a patient who's now towards 50s or 60-ish, then a diagnosis of unstable is very, very less likely. And at your level, I hope that the examiners don't keep an unstable patient in that age group because it's a very complicated case. It's a complicated scenario. So for all practical purposes, your unstable shoulder will be a youngish guy in his 20s or a less commonly a female also, but mostly 90% cases are males in 20s will be an unstable shoulder. A, a cuff tear would be presenting after the 40-ish 40, 40 or 50-ish years of age, um, uh, slightly oldish and probably very, very rare in less than 30. 30 to 40 still possible, but still rare. So most pract your practical purposes, a cuff tear patient at the postgraduate level will be more than 40 and more likely to be more than 50. An unstable shoulder is in is 20-ish. So uh, let me just give you some uh, indications of which features on the examination are more specific, which are less specific. I'll be just indicating with this color code when you have a patient and you're examining it. So for example, you have a patient and you ask them what is the site of pain in the shoulder so shoulder pain of course they all come with shoulder pain but where exactly is the shoulder pain situated and and mostly a supraspinatus or an anterior cuff tear or a super or, a, or any rotator cuff tear mostly presents with a shoulder pain that is more on the anterior aspect but it is not very specific it could be a diffuse shoulder pain all around the shoulder radiating back to the uh, trapezius or sometimes even back down to the arm. But uh, if you have someone who's saying that more of anterior shoulder pain, it's very, very indicative, okay, but not very diagnostic. Now, then another feature which you should be observing for is examining the shoulder with the shoulder uh, unclothed and be seen from all around and very, very, uh, 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 you should be noting the posterior shoulder should be noted first because that is where the atrophy is more visible. Now, superior shoulder, your supraspinatus atrophy is not that visible because it is hidden by the trapezius. So if you are observing atrophy, you should be observing it posteriorly and not anteriorly or superiorly. So posterior shoulder as seen or indicated by the arrow, by the blue arrow, uh, there's a hollowing in the infraspinatus fossa. There is no muscle over it. So it's very, very evident if there is a rotator cuff tear, which is long standing and which is massive, leading to a muscle atrophy. So this is very diagnostic. This is very, very specific uh, feature, which will uh, strengthen your differential in, in, in this direction. And when you go, then after that, when you've observed it, you've, you've taken a little bit of history, then you go to the range of motion examination and the muscle testing. Uh, which includes both active and passive. So uh, for a shoulder, especially uh, uh, the range of motion is of paramount importance. And you have to first ask them to do active movements and then do passive movements with your own hands. So, and record both of them because many diagnoses will be made after your range of motion examination step is done with. For example, I'll go ahead. These are the, uh, the, the examination, the range of motion examination that you have to record. Uh, at a basic minimum, elevation, external rotation, internal rotation. For example, this female will be doing elevation. So you just ask them to take their hand up as they can. And you look at both sides and you see the angle made of the arm with the thorax. And you note it for both sides. Now this is active movement. You'll ask them to do passive movement also. Then this is external rotation. So most commonly and most easily done is with the elbow adduct. And you ask them to external rotate the uh, the forearm out, and you note the angle with the uh, with the with the axis of the body, and both sides again. Then this is internal rotation, so this is not with the help of any angle. Internal rotation is very commonly and easily noted with the help of thumb reaching the back of the uh, patient and extended thumb. So tip of the thumb wherever it reaches. So you have to note at the uh, land uh, the the vertebral level so it could be 
for example starting with greater trochanter then goes to si joint then goes to l4 then goes to l1 and t7 so these are four or five landmarks that you uh, noting your internal notation at the end of this range of motion examination you should have a fair idea that the patient is stiff or not if there is a stiffness means both the movement active and passive are restricted for example in this patient if you see his range of motion is restricted as compared to the other side so it's always comparison with the normal side so his elevation is restricted is probably 90 degree okay so uh, just to note the angle if you see with the thorax it's around 90 100 something in between of the right side and the left side he can take it completely up so this right side is restricted active and passive so i've done both active and passive in one go i i've asked him to elevated actively and then asked and made push against and so passive restriction also is revealed so also the external rotation so i have asked him to do active and further i test passive so and then you test it on comparison with the normal opposite side so opposite side should be normal only then you can compare now this is the abduction which also i am testing but it is restricted the last one is the internal rotation which is Uh, probably also restricted, not seen in this video, but uh, those are the three movements that you note. And at the end of this, you get a stiffness, a a, diff, a, a, a diagnosis of stiffness, but not the cause. So diagnosis of stiffness just means that there is a restriction of active and passive. But then, why is it stiff? The reason. This is the differential which you'll have to say that these are the three possible causes. Most commonly, coming from the most common. The, so these flight will be the most common so it should be on the top differential second most common will be the arthritis which is less common than adhesive capsulitis so arthritis will be a degenerative cartilage disease of any etiology it could be osteoarthritis could be rheumatoid arthritis could be any other uh, uh, sort of inflammatory arthritis then the least common there are other causes but they are less common for example a neglected posterior dislocation also present in a similar way a stiff shoulder uh, and this is one of the last cause that you should mention because it is not very common uh, you would see only very uh, few times in a year but adhesive capsulitis you will see many many so that is on top of your differential and for this you will need to do further investigations to differentiate between the three or the between the other diagnosis now if you have not diagnosed true stiffness after this then you may have a patient of pseudo paralysis so either it will be stiff or if you have this then you can form a differential so this is a pseudo paralysis what that means is that when you ask her to do active elevation she is not able to do or she is hardly able to do and but passively she can go completely up so it is a pseudo paralysis in elevation and pseudo paralysis in external rotation both so in active external rotation is it but passively you can do more so which means that she is pseudo paralytic both in elevation as well as external rotation which which means that the active movements are limit, are limited but passively she is doing she has full movements so uh, at this stage now you ruled out stiffness so this is a pseudo paralytic patient a pseudo paralysis has again a differential which could be a rotator cuff tear for most most of you for all practical purposes a post graduate student and a common clinical scenario a cuff tear may present as a pseudo paralysis i'm saying may present doesn't always present like this but it may present with the pseudo paralysis a gt fracture may also present as a pseudo paralysis it is one and the same thing a gt fracture or a rotator cuff tear leads to the same thing which means that the the dynamic compression and the uh, the uh, the uh, elevation movement of the cuff has gone the less common uh, differential for a pseudo paralysis would be a suprascapular nerve compression at the notch area which again leads to a dysfunction of the rotator cuff muscles indirectly and a paralysis a pseudo paralysis like picture just like a rotator cuff tear uh, but it is very very less common so the top differential would be a rotator cuff tear uh, or a gt fracture uh, and most commonly but you have to say the rotator cuff tear first suprascapular nerve compression is is the last differential only if you are pressed for it to give an answer of more what could it more what could more it 
reasons B. So those will be then you go down the list. But rotator cuff tear will be the most common 80-90% chance that it is a rotator cuff tear. There are other causes. There are there, there are uh, idiop idiopathic brachial neuritis um, uh, also. But those are very very less common. So now but you a if you've ruled out these differentials you can move ahead now so you've ruled out a stiff shoulder then you can move ahead then you can do other test of rotator cuff tear so if you moved ahead in the examination flow chart or, or, or then you already know that he's not stiff so if he's already stiff there is no use of doing these further tests because they are not very diagnostic and they are misleading so one of the criteria for going ahead with the specific test of rotator cuff is that you already ruled out he's not having a stiff shoulder. There could be a diagnosis of stiff shoulder and rotator cuff together, but those again are very small percentage and a complicated scenario should not be kept for you. If they are kept for you, you've already done good in your examination and these uh, patients are just there to test you. So, but even in clinical scenario, a diagnosis of stiff shoulder and rotator cuff tail is not very common. So, but having said that, let's move on and do some specific test of rotator cuff because you move, because you already decided he is not, he is not a case of, uh, of, uh, of a stiff shoulder. So now this is a very first test or the common test done, Job test for supraspinatus. So patient is AB ducted in the plane of scapula. I'm pressing down, patient is pressing up. So you check the power both sides you compare it so again you check it with the help of the grading system of power grade 0 is no power grade 3 you know uh, with the gravity eliminated so grade 4 is with some resistance grade 5 is full resistance then again this is the infraspinatus again with the elbow adducted and the patient tries to external rotate and i will try and force him or force her i'm sorry inside so i'm checking the external rotation power so on all these tests basically what i'm doing is I'm checking the specific muscles power and you may also get a pain symptom with these tests that is not very specific more specific is the elicit if you elicit weakness if you elicit weakness in these tests it's very very uh, specific pointing towards your diagnosis so for example let's see this patient who will be tested for the uh, infraspinatus okay so elbow ejected i'm asking him to external rotate and he is not able to do it on the right side he is also having pain but he is weak which i could test or i could check with my hand pressing him inside so i could feel the resistance and the resistance will tell me the power of that specific muscle then again this is the third muscle we don't test for teres minor like this but we uh, i'll tell you how to test for teres minor in the end but this is the third muscle most commonly that is tested is sub subscap or subscapularis so patient is asked to hold the hand sorry um in a straight line with the hand wrist and elbow one straight line and he pushes towards her tummy so it's a belly press test so she is forcing my hand towards her belly belly press test this is called and i can check the power of internal rotation so subscap is an internal rotator and i'm checking the power of internal rotation like this now, what happens if you have a subscap tear? So this is what happens if you have a subscap tear. Okay, patient is not able to, first of all, get this elbow, wrist, and hand in one straight line. Okay, so he doesn't use his subscap to internal rotate or push the belly. He uses his other muscles and he has this angle which suggests that there is a subscap tear. He is not able to put the elbow, wrist, and hand in one straight line or in extended position and uh, force my hand towards the tummy. So this is a positive belly press test. In fact, even if you see an angle like this, in which he's unable to extend at the wrist, then that is very diagnostic of a subscap tear. And this is the last, so teres minor is, is indicated if you have a presence of this sign. So what this guy is doing is, so he says that when he has to eat, his elbow goes up. So he cannot eat normally like how we do by taking the hand to the mouth with the elbow resting down because that 
requires a lot of external rotation power with teres minor so this is very diagnostic of a teres minor tear because he cannot and he elevates the elbow to take the hand to the mouth so this is also called trumpeting or a, a, a horn blower sign a positive trumpet sign which happens in teres minor okay now when you go ahead after the examination part you maybe are required to answer specific questions in management for example which is the next investigation why should you do it now x ray is always the next investigation uh, always so why would you do an x ray and what do you need to look for it first of all you just need to rule out any other alternative diagnosis any bony problem which may present similarly for example a calcific tendinitis may present similar way uh, with a subacromial bursitis they will have all the tests positive an acrom now uh, if you have gone ahead with the diagnosis you may need to see other things in the x ray like for example acromion spurs those are helpful in planning management a superior head migration it is a sign of an irreparable rotator cuff tear so if you see a humeral head which is touching the acromion uh, you see that it is you you already know it, it passed the stage of repairability so it is an advanced rotator cuff tear you already know with the help of this uh, observation in the x ray and of course you rule out other uh, bony problems but uh, if if you are asked what all is important to see in the x ray these are the important points to be looked for in the x ray and the most telltale sign would be a superior head migration now what is your investigation but which you'll do next after the x ray i mostly most of us and for all practical purposes mri tells you about a rotator cuff more than any other diagnosis more than ultrasound or any or a ct or a, or there are multiple investigation possibilities but mri would be the investigation of choice why would you do it so first of all you have to confirm the diagnosis you have an indication and a suspicion only after clinical examination you are not very sure you have to be sure by looking at the mri mri will confirm the suspicion in the mind then after the diagnosis it is a planning of repair the planning of repairability is it repairable or not and staging of muscle fatty infiltration those are all planning and uh, a decision for uh, repairable or not repairable cuff tears so this is why you should always say after x ray it is it, there comes the stage for mr um, i'm pressed further uh, ct mr ct uh, is not very uh, helpful and we don't do ct uh, in rotator cuff tears unless there is an arthritis so now i'll just leave it at this because rotator cuff tears is a big topic and dr hithil chiniwala will be talking more about that uh, i will just go on to the shoulder uh, instability part uh, which is a very very common scenario and high chances it's going it may be there in your exam case uh, and, and a very very common diagnosis as well so some things about uh, instability or unstable shoulder you have to remember four points in an unstable shoulder it should be voluntary there should be a recurrence there should be subluxation or dislocation and in 90 to 95% chances it would be anterior a posterior recurrent dislocation is a rare entity it is possible but we see it very very less commonly so for all practical purposes mostly for you it will be an involuntary recurrent subluxation or dislocation and anterior in most cases now how would you approach the patient so most important part of the entire case scenario is the history your diagnosis is made 90% of the time on the history the patient should tell you that how does the humeral head come out and how does he reduce it uh, reduces it i'm sorry and what position of the hand makes it come out and what position of the hand makes it go in what does he have to do and how many times has it been happening when did it happen how did it happen the first time if he tells you that it comes out like this and then he has to do this something to bring it in you are very very sure that you, it is an unstable shoulder um if there is a history that he has been to the hospital where he is needed reduction in ga or otherwise that again is pointing to a diagnosis of a unstable shoulder so uh, as such your unstable shoulder is very very clear uh, after your history if there is some doubt of course 
you can do we always do these test uh, uh, physical tests so apprehension testing and laxity signs are to be done for completion purposes and apprehension test is a very important test so you take the hand like this try to push the humeral head out and see if he has any apprehension so if he has any apprehension it's very very indicative of a unstable shoulder uh, and this test is a very old test this is a very commonly done test and you should be uh, doing this test because it, it it this is the only test which is more specific in this case now laxity signs cannot be ignored and you have to do it in in a case that you have so sulcus sign trying to push the hand down and seeing the sulcus like over here uh, on the shoulder shows that the shoulder is lax and there are other biton score that you should know knee elbow finger and thumb extension uh, biton scores which tell you again of a hyperlaxity now there is a diagnostic tab if you have this patient because sometimes it, it is there so this is not an unstable shoulder you should see because see he is able to subluxate the shoulder at will happily without any problem no pain so he can dislocate and relocate or subluxate and relocate easily on his own so this is a voluntary uh, and this is not an unstable shoulder so investigations again so now your diagnosis if it's made x ray will help you in couple of things telltale signs hill sacks and a bankart bony fragment Uh, it it is not the invest it is not something that you use for diagnosis your diagnosis is already made now you go ahead with other helpful things for example an x ray and mri of course mri comes next so it tells you things but they are more important in planning and if you are going for a surgery or not so labral tear location bony bank cut slab tears bone loss a bone loss is better seen on a ct scan but yes mri is done most commonly now management so i'll just break it into two uh, dichotomous parts which is uh, so it's not very confusing if you have a question that what will you do for the patient it's one of the two so in most cases for uh, for the post graduate level and for question and answer sessions in your examination it would be either a bank cut repair in most cases or if there is a significant bone loss which may be defined as a bone loss more than 20% it would be an additional bony procedure such as lateral j okay so but you should always say the bank card repair first because lateral j is of course done very commonly but the basic procedure is being done in most of the centers would be a bank card repair so at post graduate level it would be a bank card repair if no significant bone loss and if significant bone loss it will be a bony procedure such as a lateral j thank you i'm on time hello yeah uh, dipit yeah uh, i just stop share yeah so that so that's great yeah so we are bang on time so just uh, have i understood it correctly so if a student sees a short case of shoulder uh, he takes a brief history and he comes to a conclusion whether it's a instability or it's a stiffness case and then he asked the patient to do certain movements like forward flexion abduction external rotation one external rotation two internal rotation and then taking it on the back and noting it down the how much the range he has and then uh, passively doing the same movement right yeah. so in a way have i summated it rightly so if the patient yeah. is able to fully do it actively Uh, yeah. then there will be some restriction so it will tell us that it's a shift stiff shoulder and however if the patient is unable to do a movement and we are able to take that movement through to the fullest extent that means it's a weakness so it's probably a cuff tear or uh, some other such for yeah. all practical purpose it's a cuff tear yes so so I, am i uh, submitting it correctly yes correctly yes and and one maybe you would just like to tell the students what is the right way to do a shoulder ap x ray yeah so mostly we do a true anterior posterior x ray of the shoulder if somebody asks you that's a good point actually if if somebody asks you what x ray will you do and then so you will have to say a true ap x ray in because the patient should be positioned slightly obliquely in the the plane of the scapula naturally is anti rotated so you'll make it horizontal okay and then you'll uh, shoot it straight through and through so you see the glenohumeral joint so that is the true anterior posterior view which is done by positioning the patient slightly oblique in order to put the scapula in the horizontal plane 
that is a good point yeah and you mentioned about the proximal migration of the humeral head uh, in a cuff tear and you said that then that's a sign of irreparability correct so that is one of the thing that if you see on an x ray you should not miss it it is very much looking at you and uh, somebody may want to ask you what does this mean uh, of uh, of a humeral head superior migration so superior head migration is very very head indicative of a massive cuff tear which is now irreparable um it is it is an advanced if advanced stage of rotator cuff uh, it is one of the stages of rotator cuff arthritis also a stage 3 presents like this with a complete superior head migration touching the acromion would be a stage 3 uh, uh, rotator cuff tear uh, uh, arthropathy and if on the x ray the humeral head is coming down then it is indicative of deltoid uh... yeah so is you that maybe a occasional patient if you have a paratic hemiplegic or some paraplegic a paresis patient uh, for some reason has a deltoid palsy then the shoulder will droop down which means the humeral head will droop down so uh, will inferiorly migrate so uh, yeah two distinctions cuff tear superior migration deltoid inferior migration two opposite planes so this is important to remember superior migration cuff tear inferior migration deltoid palsy okay so guys students who are tuned in i think uh, for a purpose of your short case clinical examination um you may you may want to review this particular talk a couple of times to actually get a grasp of what are the range of movements what is the uh, normal range of movements as compared to the opposite side what is active movement what is passive movements and sort of lock it in your brains you know it's not going to happen every day that you are going to be discussing shoulder evaluation in detail so now without further ado we'll uh, move over to dr hetal chiniwala's talk who will be uh, further elaborating on uh, stiff shoulder and uh, and cuff tears from the perspective of the students yeah just give me a minute i will annotate okay so i will stay shoot off straight i am going to talk to you about painful shoulder now remember one thing when uh, Uh, most common two tendency mistakes a student or a examining going student makes or uh, when you are giving exam is one is you jump to diagnosis and second is you jump to treatment now what happens is the biggest culprit in exams is the invigilator he comes and tell you take this short case this is a shoulder case this is a knee case and that is where you are screwed the moment you are told shoulder case and if he tries to be more helpful and he will tell you boss ye cuff hai so that is the time you are you are doomed to fail because now you have, your mind is shut to everything else you don't know who has admitted that patient for exam whether it maybe it's a houseman and he has not examined he has just under thought that it's a frozen shoulder and admitted and it will it may turn out to be something completely different so first thing is in the rule in the exams remember one thing if you jump to diagnosis and second thing if you jump to a treatment you are doomed to fail so let us start with the uh, uh first slide when you want to diagnose something and when you want to know something you should know what you want to look for unless and until you know what you are looking for you will never find it and that is why you must always know in a patient who has a who comes to you with a arm pain not a shoulder pain someone who tells you that they has or she has pain here it doesn't mean it is coming from shoulder it may be coming from uh, sorry yeah annotation I'm not getting the annotation it may be coming from uh, either a, a cervical spine it can be coming from thoracic outlet it can be coming from shoulder joint itself or it can be combination of them i have seen a number of patient who have combination of all of this and that is the reason your diagnostic when there ever there is a arm pain case i will again say not shoulder case arm pain case you must understand it can be a frozen shoulder it can be a rotator cuff tendinitis or tear it can be a cervical radiculopathy it can be a thoracic outlet syndrome or it can be a combination of all of it so unless and until your mind and eyes are open to these possibilities you are going to miss the diagnosis <clears throat> so before starting on how to go about approaching the patient i would first like to tell you basics of each 
in a very primitive way. Number one, primary frozen shoulder, the pathology is primarily in joint capsule. It is not in the muscles or tendon. The joint capsule shrinks and it starts usually at the rotator interval. Now, rotator interval is here between the supraspinatus tendon and the subscapularis. That is what first starts shrinking and the pain starts and that is why <clears throat> the pain is more of anterior. And here the cuff is primarily normal. If the cuff is not normal, it is not a primary frozen shoulder. It's a secondary stiffness. We'll come to it. Second thing. So if the capsule is shrunk, if the cuff is normal, that means the passive movements are restricted. And usually it is the external rotation, which is first to get affected. And this is very a key point in my clinical practice. I depend a lot on this external rotation to know what the pro problem is. So remember one thing, in a primary frozen shoulder, it's an external rotation which will first to go where the passive movements are restricted, the cuff is still normal. Whereas in a patient who has a cuff tendinitis or tear, primary pathology is in the subacromal where either it is a partial rotator cuff tear which can be on a glenohumeral side or it can be a bursal side tear or a bursitis or a calcification. The primary pathology is in this space. <clears throat> not in the capsule. However, the capsule will get secondarily involved and what will get involved is a posterior capsular stiffness and tightness and that results in painful internal rotation. So, a patient who has a painful internal rotation is usually a cuff patient, a patient who has an external rotation which is restricted, it is uh, usually adhesive capsulitis. This is something I always keep in my mind whenever I examine a patient of shoulder. <clears throat> Again, so cuff tests are painful in patients with rotator cuff tendinitis or tear. They are painful but not passively restricted like in adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. And passive restriction comes at a latest stage when the posterior capsule is involved in a rotator cuff or it may be early stage also. So passive internal rotation is restricted in cuff patients. So <clears throat> to summarize, front Anterior rotator interval involvement with the capsular involvement is adhesive capsulitis of frozen shoulder. Subacromial, bursal or cuff involvement is, a, is in patients with cuff tendinitis or tear. These are the two primary pathologies. Here I am including only those because Dipita has already mentioned to you how you see this instability patient. The patient type is different. The patient class is different. So they, when this basic thing is stuck in your brain, it's uh, in your brain, it is easier for you to approach the patient. <clears throat> so my diagnosis start, starts with history. Remember, any patient who comes with acute history of non-traumatic pain, do not label as a uh, adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder as a or a rotator cuff tear, it is more often than not calcifying tendinitis. Even if I don't see x-ray on calcification, for me, a non-traumatic acute pain is calcification because many a times this calcification is in subscapularis for which you need an axillary view. AP view, it may overlap and you may not be able to see it. So I, either if the patient is very painful, I do not try to just do everything at, uh, at that time. I will wait for a few days. Once the patients become a little comfortable, I will do a axillary or a trans or a, a scapular Y view to see if there is a subscapular is calcification. So keep, keep this in mind. <clears throat> Second uh, thing is night pain. Usually night pains tells you the chronicity of the and the severity of problem. So it doesn't mean that if the patient has night pain, it is just a frozen shoulder or it is not a cuff tear or something. It can be, it just shows you that what is the severity of the disease. And of course the injury helps. But it is not a panacea. A patient with rotator cuff tear may not tell you any injury. At the same time, some patients who have adhesive capsulitis, they say that they had got injury because they are just trying to link uh, the two things. So injury is important uh, find <clears throat> on history taking, but it is not something which will decide entirely my diagnosis. Now, importance is of type of pain. Now, people who have this frozen shoulder, they will say, say I have sudden episodes of subtle jerk and I get pain. Even if someone shakes my hand, I get severe pain. This is the pain of an inflamed capsule. If it is a shooting pain, importance is very important because we sometimes miss to ask whether the patient's pain goes all the way down to the hand. And if it is so, 
do not label it as just shoulder pain it will be either a cervical pain if it is associated with numbness discoloration it can be a thoracic outlet syndrome you look at this i have seen a lot of patients who have this who have been unnecessarily diagnosed as a shoulder pain or a cervical uh, radiculitis and then comes the site of pain again i am still at history i have not looked at the i have not examined the patient usually the patient with rotator cuff or glenohumeral joint they will say the pain is on the side of the arm a patient with a neck pain and a referred pain is usually on the back of the shoulder and in the scapular region and it can radiate all the way down to the hand usually when the patient says the pain is in the front of the arm it is usually coming either from the rotator interval or a biceps it is more common in patients with primary frozen shoulder or biceps and pathology or isolated biceps pathology is not so common and when the patient says with this tip of the finger that i have pain here i know i am i am uh, talking about the acromioclavicular joint the tip of the finger on the top of the shoulder acromioclavicular joint is the culprit so these are the things which will give you a general idea and outlook about what you are looking at i am still at history remember and by the time my history taking is over i should have an idea about the site of pathology whether it's a shoulder cervical spine or another and the extent of problem if you don't have idea about this that means either you don't know what to ask or you are missing something you need to go back and ask so by the time of history taking i am already thinking what treatment i am going to give this patient i am already thinking what investigations i am going to have for this patient so then i'll go to the clinical examination after having known a lot of thing about shoulder first thing is look from me and now this patient i just saw two two days back you see she is standing straight but this shoulder it is going all the way down this is drooping now why in cuff pathologies because the cuff is weak the shoulder scapula becomes tilted and droop and that's why the shoulder tilts forward whereas in a painful shoulder for example say any adhesive capsulitis or severely painful as a protection patient elevates the shoulder and they hold it kind of thing so when that is there so usually it is not a 100% uh, confirm but whenever there is a droop shoulder i know that there is a problem with the cuff this is something which you should not miss when you whenever you are looking and always look at the shoulder uh, patient from behind not from the front because that is what will give you almost everything you need to know then what i will do is first is i'll make the patient lie down and first i will check is the passive external rotation for me free external rotation means this is not a primary frozen shoulder this is not a primary frozen shoulder this is something which is very important for me a external rot rotation restriction means classical primary frozen shoulder whereas as i mentioned in cuff pathology internal rotation is restricted due to posterior capsular tightness whereas external rotation will be reasonably free unless it is second secondarily stiff after a long term rotator cuff problem second thing see for the for example this patient the internal rotation is restricted young patient with reasonable uh, move, but painful movement internal rotation restricted this is kind this is a cuff pathology i am thinking of it can be anything tendinized is tear it can be just subacromial uh, issue so second thing i see is forward elevation again if you see this patient frozen shoulder it's a restricted it is a firm end point i am not getting it. it is a firm end point and this is a case of primary frozen shoulder whereas if you see in a rotator cuff pathology there is a full forward elevation but it's painful it's painful this is something which is important where passive movements are there but they are painful then dipit has already told you how to differentiate between the uh, uh, different rotator cuff pathology supraspinatus infraspinatus subscapularis tests so i am not going to go into detail of it so this is a typical patient of a frozen shoulder see this i am patiently lying down i will try to and see there is a restriction form end point i would say okay i'll let it run its normal speed so that i again see external rotation restricted perfect 
so now i will ask him to stand i always look at the this two lying down because the scapulae stabilize i'll have a better idea here see cuff is okay these are rotator job stay job stays this for infraspinatus again you have to stabilize the elbow this is how you do and then this uh, subscapularis for me as there are different ways of examining subscapularis this is a short way of doing it so this is how it happens all the tests we have done so this is a case of now one thing which we have never been taught to look at is scapula no one has ever told me to look at scapula when i was studying what i do is first thing i look at scapula because it is one of the commonest misstructure and it answer most of your problem unanswered question you see this patient has a protracted scapula you see the level of the scapula here it is drooping like this now this is a very important finding for me again a dyna this kinetic in a v scapula can be a very common root cause of all your shoulder and cervical spine problems because it compensates for the weak, weak rotator cuff it compensates for the bad posture a weak scapula in turn can overstrain your cervical spine and shoulder so i always look at again a droop scapula this is of course a congenital uh, uh, issue again stress uh, on strength test scapula st you can see the weak scapula again the weak scapula i never fail to look at a scapula look at this case in point 40 year old male neck pain referred to me left arm not relieved by analgesic steroid modalities mri showed degenerative disc disease you can see there is some restriction of shoulder movement but see scapula and when i do the strength testing there is a drooping of scapula and this is what here i know you see how great his bicep his deltoid is is like a bodybuilder but he has a weak scapula so this is a great a uh, building without a good pillar this is going to fail this shoulder is doomed to fail again i what i do is a scapular stabilization test whatever is painful for example this patient internal rotation was painful i stabilize the scapula and i did the internal rotation it increases so this is very important you can see again forward elevation with the stabilization of scapula the it improves and it becomes not non painful so these are the scapular stabilization test very simple test but it helps you look at a lot of issues then i will always i always i start my examination of any shoulder with neck movements neck movements trapezius spasm look at the neurological deficit and signs of thoracic outlet syndrome which is a hyper abduction test that is something basic i do and i do nothing else and i look at the radial pulse i'll take the patient's arm in abduction external rotation and then i know if it is a a uh, thoracic outlet problem or no so at the end of clinical examination you have what you have a painful shoulder which is either stiff shoulder or a weak shoulder a stiff shoulder has a restricted movement which is a primary frozen shoulder or a weak shoulder which has either a rotator cuff pathology or a scapular dyskinesia so at the end of your examination you either have a stiff or a weak shoulder or combination of the in a complicated case a weak shoulder that is becoming stiff that is in this case internal rotation affects it first then ir or a stiff shoulder that is becoming weak because of disuse and the rotator cuff is slowly becoming weak so this can be confusing but uh, as i said stick to the basics and you will know what exactly whether you are dealing with the stiff shoulder and a weak shoulder why because treatment is different the conservative treatment also is different in this patients so when you give diagnosis in exam say i am either let's say for example a frozen shoulder i am dealing with a case of primary frozen shoulder associated if you find a weakness of supra or cuff tear don't say the other way around or if you feel the patient has a full blown rotator cuff weakness then i am dealing with a case of rotator cuff tear with secondary stiffness of glenohumeral joint so this is how you have to give a diagnosis and this because that is what you have inferred from the patient's clinical assessment dipita has already mentioned about x ray to rule out glenohumeral arthritis now the common tendency for example last time i was taking exam our own candidate i asked him what are you going to do with this he is directly said mri why mri asked he said no we just normally do don't do mri straight away because mri will over diagnose mri will over diagnose and confuse and cloud your clinical judgment and then 
you will have all kinds of issues. Case in point, there is a 65 year old patient came to me uh, for a painful shoulder elevation. And they came to me with the MRI doctor, I have a bad rotator cuff tear, please, uh, we need surgery, how do I? And MRI had retracted rotator cuff problem. Now look at this patient. Clinically, patient came to me with this. Super. Complete abduction, painful right. abduction. Right. Then right. external right. rotation. Right. Patient is now this patient, whatever you do, is going to worsen. Any surgical, you lay a hand on this patient and it's going to worsen. So um, remember your treatment is going to be decided on your clinical judgment, not on your MRI finding. Drill that into your mind and heart. So there are various confusing MRI findings. First thing is tendinitis and partial rotator cuff tear. Most of the times you do a USG, this will be the diagnosis because USG can never diagnose a adhesive capsulitis. So if every shoulder pain you are sending to a sonologist also, you will always come with this diagnosis. So most common is Tendinitis and rotator cuff tear with the adhesive capsulitis is one of the commonest MRI findings because they coexist. And the decision making here depends upon the clinical presentation, whether the patient has passive restriction of motion or a weakness. <clears throat> Second chemical finding is rotator cuff tear with retraction of tendon, multiple tendon ruptures and cuff muscle fatty infiltration. This is again a MRI finding which is confusing. Here again the decision making is on a clinical presentation like I showed you in that case. So how do you say the treatment? The Once you have established a diagnosis, you have done the x-ray, you know there is not much, not a arthritis or any other thing. Do not jump to MRI first, say I will start with the rehab. And in rehab, why it is important? Because in a stiff shoulder, your aim is to stretch out the capsule first before strengthening the cuff. And this is why it is important to know whether you have a stiff shoulder or a weak shoulder. Never ever I let the patient take either a diathermy or some stupid exercise like pulley because they are undoubt, they are the sure sort way of increasing patient's pain. The biggest success is the frequency of exercise and that should be the home-based exercise program. So simple exercises, I tell them, we tell them a pendulum exercises, lying down forward elevation because here you are avoiding the acromion impingement. I'm going so, so for example, this patient had a zero ER. First week it was 30, third week it was 75. So rehab is a key. Again, this patient has IR which was on D0 side of the body by third week, it was on L5 level. Again, now when you are talking about rotator cuff injury, here the rehab is different because here not, you are trying to avoid stiffness, but you need to strengthen the cuff. And not only the cuff, individual cuff, the cuff and scapula coordination and the cuff coordination amongst themselves. This is a key to the exercise program. And that is why it is important to know whether you have a weak shoulder or you have a stiff shoulder. These are the various exercises. I don't think you right now need to know. It's just, just there. So I'll just uh, kind of, these are the cuff exercises. We need to understand how it has to be done. That's a different topic by itself. Again, uh, with cuff, there is a scapula st stabilization. Again, these are all the exercises for the scapula stabilization. Now comes the role of injection. Again, this is a common tendency for the uh, students to say that I will in go and inject. Now, if you ask them, what will you inject? Where will you inject? They are confused. Again, a big screw up when you are giving exam. You should know when to inject. You should know where to inject. And you should know how to inject. The three important issues. And that is why. Uh, and when. So let us come to when. A painful stiff shoulder due to adhesive capsulitis, which is not responsive to enough and adequate conservative treatment. Or a painful impingement, again, not uh, amenable to conservative treatment. For me, this is a very common indication. Cuff, I don't inject so much because I don't need to. Cuff tear arthropathy, where you need to know what is a functional cuff tear or from non-functional cuff tear. Now, what is that is 
like dipit said that there is something called as paralytic shoulder a patient who has a, like i showed you earlier the case where the patient had a retracted rotator cuff tear but full function that is a functional shoulder with a cuff tear if it is a different and here it makes a difference if you give injection and the patient can actively do all the movements without which that is a functional shoulder and there the treatment will be different so here the injection can help and of course acromioclavicular joint arthritis because i short of steroid and it does well most of the time so what we do is we can give a suprascapular block to ac joint this dipit has taught me how to give or you are with the pain management specialist with the sonography or with this you can block the suprascapular now you do a glenohumeral injection for adhesive capsulitis and for impingement you give subacromial injection which can be ultrasound guided so again where you inject is very important i have seen lot of patient who have been injected once twice thrice with steroid with no relief because primarily the surgeon has not known where to inject so this is very important this is how you will talk even in exams again painful shoulder retractor cuff so what i did i just injected and now see post injection complete pain free functional now why should i touch the patient with knife never i will touch this patient with knife full external rotation full elevation don't need to do anything just the rehab and this patient is done then comes the role of surgery now it's too much to talk about surgery right now but there are certain important point where what surgery you will advise now arthroscopic bankart repair you can say either arthroscopic in exam or mini open no one is going to kill you for that depending on what you have seen or what you have experience you can say anything but the indication has to be right a rotator cuff what is a ideal rotator cuff repair which has no significant retraction which has no infiltration of cuff which has a good tissue and good bone and good rehab and that is why to see a good bone you need a good x ray if the patient is osteoporotic if the patient has bad tissue if the patient has muscle infiltration it is like stitching a bad cloth it is going to fail so that is why you are where you are operating what operation is very important and there are lots of non cuff repair surgeries in rotator cuff tear which you should know as a exam going student so uh, for example if it's a functional shoulder where you have good active movements you can either give injection or just simply do a bicep stenotomy for pain relief or a rehab these are the non cuff surgeries in a cuff tear patients this patient again a retracted cuff tear sorry it's a basic complete uh, this was after bicep stenotomy this was after bicep stenotomy didn't need anything else so but in a non functional shoulder which has a weak abduction weak elevation and external rotation there are many surgeries like superior capsular reconstruction reverse shoulder arthroplasty or tendon transfer again you should just know that these things exist you need not know in detail if you are not experienced and you need not mug anything for this if you just know the basics you don't need to go in detail of all these surgeries which are super specialty surgeries again arthroscopic scapular release very rarely uh, a good shoulder surgeon very rarely does a arthroscopic release because most of them will do well with a rehab or with as the most injection and that is why but you have to know that a patient who has not done well for 6 months after rehab steroids etc is uh, uh, they are ready for arthroscopic scapular release so again order of importance for me clinical evaluation on shoulder decision making based upon clinical evaluation and the right surgery in the right patient at the right time and that's what ends my talk so again for exam going students please realize please understand that it is not what you know about the case what is being told to you by the invigilator but it is how you logically deduct like sherlock holmes in a case and quickly so if you know what you have to look for if you practice what you have to look for and if you keep practicing then in exam it becomes a cake walk that's where my lecture ends any let's now start discussion uh, uh hetel uh, if you can uh, just uh, uh, repeat that uh, particular uh, slide on that clinical thing so this is a case of uh, um 
you said you know adhesive capsulitis due to cuff or this is cuff yeah ha huh, that one i think yeah so i have not of course mentioned age whatever you say a case mm -hmm. of primary frozen shoulder with or without associated weakness of rotator cuff if it is weak then you say it is weak not there not don't say oh hmm. a case of weak shoulder like a case of rotator cuff or uh, tear with um, weakness of supraspinatus or infraspinatus or subcutaneous depending on what you find with or without secondary stiffness of glenohumeralgia that is how i will give my diagnosis if i was a student right great arshad uh, do you want to ask anything for the in the better interest of students i think what brother uh, presented was absolutely uh, to the point and very practical way of approaching a patient with uh, shoulder pathology and how to come to a conclusion in the exam but remember students in the exam to get a shoulder case with a rotator cuff you will not get a confusing case like the people were saying that if you have this with that it's a problem you will either get an instability or you will get a plain rotator cuff tear or you will get a glenohumeral arthritis this would be your three diagnoses to make yeah. and shoulder cases we all know are difficult to diagnose clinically unless you are really really into shoulder examination and doing shoulder uh, uh, surgeries on a, on a on a daily basis like what hetal and dipit are doing so uh, even if you reach a conclusion that this is extra articular stiffness related to a rotator cuff or a primary rotator cuff Uh, a primary adhesive capsulitis resulting in stiffness of shoulder that would clinch your passing marks beyond that is you are aiming for gold or aiming for higher degree of uh, of uh, marks so uh, what hetal said practically is the correct way what uh, dipit told you how to examine and what to check is absolutely right so if students have any questions they can always visit this lecture and If you see it twice or thrice, you most of your questions will be answered. So there will be three types of cases. One is a per person who will give a clear history of recurrent dislocation of shoulder. Second will be one who is a stiff shoulder, and third will be a one with a pseudo paralysis. Right? Those who will not be able to do a certain movement. Am I right? And um, usually, see, I laugh. For example, I I'll, uh, I'll give you a live example. Last time when I was examining the student, had a case. Now he had a very painful shoulder with some impingement, some restriction. And from starting, uh, just it started as that. Okay, I am going to this a pain, frozen shoulder. I'll do MRI, and the things went downhill uh, from there for the candidate. Of course, we could lift up. I mean, he had basic knowledge, so there was no problem. We were there to clean the. thing but uh, the question thing is that if you have basics clear then as long as you know exactly what you are talking and you don't goof up like saying that i will image i'll do an mri just after a clinical diagnosis is going to really not gel well with the examiner when there is nothing else you are not even asked for x ray or something so this is a very common thing jumping to a conclusion so just and uh, this is how it helps i have found myself i when i past uh, ms i didn't know a damn about shoulder over a few when i practice also over a period of time my knowledge my examination skills were very poor over a period of time examining knowing your own mistake you realize these are the things which are filter for me i don't care for all the different examination tests most of the time the tendency is for student to mug the names of the tests it's like they feel that they will get a brownie points for knowing the name of complicated tests whereas you just need to know few simple tests to aid your diagnosis not just to show your examiner off so i feel that is more practical to so guys stick to the basics and i, I feel uh, i also tell my students practice rehearse talking about cases rehearse with yourself rehearse with your colleagues if you don't have make your own sort of powerpoint recordings and see how you are sounding you know because you got to sound correct and you got to sound very confident and uh, you have to feel very comfortable in leading the examiner to ask you the question which you actually want him to ask you 
rather than you know getting into an uncomfortable zone for yourself which happens in that anguish of giving the exam and uh, do not be biased what dr hetel told you is that don't just get biased even if you are told that this is a particular case keep your eyes and mind open and uh, know that the examiner has seen this case plenty of times it's been represented to him so don't bluff and don't goof if you have not seen something admit it and move ahead uh, i think uh, arshad it's about 10:05 so yeah okay. so i think we can conclude and uh, we can uh, announce that next uh, week we'll be coming with the hip, hip. session we'll come right. with the hip session yeah so I'll thanks say, a lot uh, dipit uh, had to leave dipit had to leave we thank him and thanks a lot hetal uh, it's it's been lovely coordinating with you guys it's an effort coming week on week for all of you all but it will pay off in the long run i'm sure all these facts that are there will really really help you in the exam honestly if somebody was teaching us this uh, before our exams i definitely feel we would have been better better prepared right so guys thanks for tuning in spread the word to your friends let the past uh, youtube videos also circulate it really encourages us to bring in more sessions Uh, Ashok is here. Thanks a lot, Doctor Ashok. Without you and Ortho TV, all this is just not possible. Thanks a lot to the entire Ortho TV team. So thanks a lot, guys. Good Thank night. You. Have a good weekend. Good night, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. The chat me kya messages hai, do? Thank you, hai. Thank you, message. YouTube oh, pe questions the ek do. Ek hi question tha. Okay, yahan nahi aaya. Hmm. ठीक है ना नेक्स्ट टाइम चलो गुड नाइट बाय गुड नाइट सर थैंक्स